Historically, one of the most prized stats in Fire Emblem is movement, which just as it sounds determines how far a unit can move in a turn. The applications of extra movement in an evaluation framework like efficiency that cares about how fast your clears are is obvious. More move gets you to the objective faster. However, I've recently seen the sentiment that a lot of movement isn't valuable outside of contexts that care about turn counts. Well, I disagree. Regardless of how fast you play, movement is pretty valuable. Let's talk about when move is valuable, what it does for you, and when it isn't as valuable, presuming that we aren't interested in turn counts at all. But before we get into it, a big thank you to my patrons, Aiki Poo, Lucy Sev, Danny Doyle, Acrobatic Jazz, A Family of Trees, and Helix. I really appreciate your support, and if you want to get early access to videos, shoutouts in videos, and have access to polls that influence the content schedule, you'll find a link in the video description. So let's get into what a few of the generic benefits of high movement are that applies in most situations. The big one is that high movement allows a unit to be in a lot of places in a small amount of time. For example, in the very first map of FE1, there's a thief to the south of the map, but the bulk of the enemies start to the west. If you send a high movement unit down, like your cavaliers, they can kill the thief and take advantage of their high movement to catch back up and fight the enemies on the west. Even better, if you send Sita, she can fly over the water, so killing the thief barely sets her behind the rest of your troops. On the flip side, if we were to send a slower unit like Drog to the bottom of the map, he wouldn't get back in time to fight the units coming from the left. Basically, as long as we aren't turtling to a really extreme degree here, movement is beneficial. Now, turtling is an option on this map, but let's look at another example where that is less enticing. In Chapter 4 of Fire Emblem Engage, we get the King of Movement, the Sigurd Ring, which gives its wielder a whopping 5 move, or 7 if you're a Cavalier. This map is great for showing why that's so good. I put the ring on Vander, and with it, he's going to be able to do something every single turn. On turn 1, he grabs the village while everyone moves north, and it's not a problem for him because he can just use the movement from Sigurd to catch up. On turn 2, he runs to where my army is fighting and contributes a round of combat, and on turn 3, he runs across the bridge to support Louis. I have him take a low percentage attack here because I was feeling spicy, but he could have hit a unit that wasn't in the forest too. So because of Vander's high movement with Sigurd, in 3 turns he's able to grab a village and fight two enemies in different locations on the map. That's awesome because he's always able to be helping out wherever I need him. You can also see me struggle with a lower move unit on the same map. A couple times, ETA is one move away from being able to shoot down a flyer. Now, this is my fault. If I started her at a different square, she would have had the range to hit the flyer, but you can see how higher movement allows for flexibility and room for error. While Vander can just yeet himself across the map, I need to be more deliberate with Etie's positioning to make sure that she can be where she needs to be to fight enemies. Basically, units can't be in two places at once, and traveling from point A to point B can create costly downtime. But with high movement, units can minimize the downtime and be where they would be most helpful sooner, allowing them to take as many actions as possible in a chapter. In some cases, this allows a high move unit to be able to get to a location and fix a mistake or bail out a unit that's in danger. This is especially prevalent in games with the rescue or shelter mechanic. In these games, if you made a mistake and put a unit in danger, a far away high move unit might be able to come rescue them or kill the enemy that's threatening them. But a low move unit that's far away won't be able to get there in time. Similarly, if a high move unit ever ends up in a sticky situation where they're surrounded by enemies, they can often use their high move to run away. Whereas low move units can have trouble escaping enemy ranges without help from another unit. Movement can also allow you to get to locations that don't seem time-sensitive, but actually are, such as getting to a forest tile or a fort before an enemy does. Regardless of whether you care about turn count, high move can help you position in ways that set your army up for success. In Chapter 4 of Engage, we also use our first warp, and if you can understand why warp is good, you can understand why movement is good. Warping a unit is essentially just giving them a bunch of extra move and the ability to avoid terrain. If you think that's good, then you understand why move is good. Another important feature of movement is how it interacts with enemy attack ranges. For example, a knight with only 5 move in FE1 cannot approach and attack a mage with 6 move. The mage will always get the first attack unless you manipulate the AI in some way. On the flip side, a paladin with 9 move can run in and get the first attack and possibly even one-shot the mage. So these are just some ways that movement is just generically good. High movement makes units flexible, allows them to quickly move between two locations of interest, and minimizes turns where the unit doesn't do anything. 
These are factors that are just generally useful on many Fire Emblem maps, but there are also many Fire Emblem maps that specifically reward you for not turtling or punish you if you do, and this naturally rewards units that can get places fast. My favorite example of a map that punishes you for playing too slow is Two Faces of Evil or Egg Map from Sacred Stones. In this map, there are eggs placed all over that are slowly hatching. If you kill them before they hatch, that's one less enemy you have to deal with. You're also rewarded for killing an egg before it hatches with a hefty amount of EXP. So you are punished for going slow with more enemies and with less experience. As a result, people often bring a ton of high movement units to get to the eggs as quickly as possible. This is an extreme case where stats aren't that important since eggs don't fight back, but move is at a premium. Fire Emblem loves to put little tasks in games that units don't need good stats to perform, and most maps usually have some weak enemies that may have to be dealt with but may not require good stats to kill. Good move can make completing these tasks a little easier. There are also maps that put a lower limit on how slow you're allowed to play. Sometimes this is through a turn limit, like in Radiant Dawn Chapter 2, while in other cases it can be due to the way the map is set up. In Battle Before Dawn, Jafar and Zephiel will die if you don't get down there and help them. You can still bring low move units to this map and they can help you clear the way and get to the objective eventually, but your high move units are going to be essential here for getting to the objectives and completing the map. A more recent example of this is the Eternal Stairway in Conquest. This map is a long hallway filled with ridges and a bunch of enemies, but the enemies can be frozen in place by using the dragon veins placed around the map. This is a huge map for flyers who get to leverage their high move and ability to ignore terrain to bounce from Dragon Vein to Dragon Vein, minimizing the amount of potentially dangerous combat you need to do to complete the map. There's a lot of maps that have smaller but notable rewards that are much easier to attain with high move units as well, whether that be villages, chests, or recruitable characters that are eventually going to exit the map if you don't recruit them in a timely manner. A flyer or cavalier with good move is a great boon for grabbing all of these sorts of objectives. A great example of this is basically every map in Fire Emblem 4. Villages are constantly under threat from bandits in this game, and the faster you can rescue them, the more money that you receive from them. Move is great for securing those villages and making sure your favorite units keep full wallets to repair their weapons and buy them rings. In games with rescue and pair up, Units can also lend their high move to other units, which can open up some great strategies for us. Airdropping a combat unit to the bottom of Distant Blade in FE8 lets us clear out a ton of enemies there, making things easier for the rest of our army and scoring us the Rapier Village. So all of those are some of the ways movement can be a benefit to you, regardless of whether or not you care about turn counts. But I do want to be clear that move is not the end-all be-all in all cases. There are also situations where move is not the most important. In a big route map with no time-sensitive side objectives, like Village of Silence in FE8, move doesn't feel super essential for clearing the map. Move is still good for some of the things it's always good for, like fixing errors you make and getting from one group of enemies to the next, but you aren't getting a ton of value out of it here if you don't care about speed for speed's sake. Clearing this map with a big blob of units moving one space per turn really doesn't lose you much on this map. So this should illustrate that there are some maps that do not emphasize movement as much as others. So I've talked a few times about how high movement units can make lots of contributions, but I haven't talked about the other stats that are sometimes necessary in order to make those contributions. In games with rescuing or side objectives like villages that sometimes don't require good combat to get, move is very much a virtue in and of itself. You don't need to have good combat stats for your move to be useful if you can rescue a better combat unit and drop them off where they need to go. Vanessa could have zeros in most stats and still do the distant blade rescue drop in FE8. However, many games don't have rescuing or pair up, and in these games, move is less helpful if the unit isn't at least somewhat competent at fighting enemies once they get wherever they need to go. Basically, in many situations, getting from place to place quickly isn't enough if you suck when you get there. For this reason, a common sentiment is that many players would like to trade good move for great stats. Fortunately, most games don't actually force us to make that decision. Often the high move units are not meaningfully worse at combat than their low move counterparts, and sometimes the high move units just have good stats. We can see this in units like Seth, Marcus, Camilla, and Xander. In other cases, strong foot units exist, but the difference between them and the high movement units may not be much in practice. Remember that Fire Emblem is a game of benchmarks. If an enemy takes 20 damage to kill, dealing 20 to them is as good as dealing 40. 
So in a lot of cases, even if horse units don't have the best stats in your army, if their stats are good enough to hit the relevant benchmarks for the tasks you want them to perform, they're perfect. And it's often enough that a high move unit will have good enough stats to hit the important benchmarks on a map, even if they are on paper worse than some footlocked counterpart. It's also worth noting that in most games, it's easier to fix other stats, while move can be pretty difficult to improve. Most stats can be increased in a variety of ways via stat boosters, tonics, meals, supports, even just by leveling up. And you can increase your functional strength by using stronger weapons. Movement is harder to increase in the same way. Often there's just one pair of boots in a game, with the only other sources of move being promotions. More modern games have included a few additional ways to increase move, including pair-up bonuses, reclassing, and unique buffs like Three Houses Stride or Engage's Sigurd Ring. The result of this is that in many cases, if you have a high move unit that doesn't quite hack it statistically, you can fix their statistical weaknesses. But it's more difficult to improve the move of a unit with solid stats but low move, except in games with rescue and pair up where you can sort of have a low move unit borrow someone else's high move. To be clear, this does not mean that every high move unit is great and every low move unit is bad. Games often include difficult combat that a strong foot unit can be great for. Oswin in FE7 is awesome for early defense maps and objectives that don't require high movement to get to in time. Often you'll send Marcus to go do some objective that's far away and have Oswin do the more close by one. In FE3 Book 1, Agma is great for dealing with high evasion enemies where you really appreciate his good skill. Additionally, sometimes a foot unit really just does have great combat. Amber and Panette both have great combat in Engage in the Warrior class and they're going to be one of your more powerful enemy phase options. And we use footlocked staff users all the time in games like Thracia for their excellent utility. The point here isn't to say that low move or footlocked units are necessarily bad or that units with high move are automatically good, just that move is always a good thing even if you don't care about turn counts. And if you're a low move unit, ideally you need to bring great combat or utility to the table because otherwise a higher move unit, even if they have slightly worse combat, will look very enticing. Anyways, that's why I like move as a stat. Thank you for sticking around until the end, and if you liked the video, consider hitting the like or subscribe button so that you never miss an upload. And if you want to talk about Fire Emblem more, consider checking out the community discord that you'll find in the video description. But either way, thanks for sticking around and have yourself a lovely week.